And over to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Louis DeValentin. I'm an associate principal at Accenture's uh, security lab. And just as a quick background about Accenture Technology Labs, we're the most forward-facing part of Accenture. Um, we're looking at things about three to five years out that are going to disrupt industry. And we've got seven different labs scattered across the world. My work is mostly focused on uh, analytics and uh, different mathematical models of modeling risk or um, attack surfaces. So organizations have always sought to mitigate risk in their environments. Um, IT professionals in, in particular have really used a lot of different methods in order to mitigate, uh, to mitigate or reduce risk. And so in the past, we've seen compliance as something that people has done as the bare minimum. Um, more recently, we've seen that people have started to migrate to rolling access certification, so ex privileges that expire and then have to be recertified. Um, patch management in general is another risk mitigation tool. Um, and then more lately, we've seen them start to use analytics to try and quantify risk within the organization as well uh, via internal dissection software, so an analytics specifically based around detecting uh, attacks and user behavior analytics, so profiling users and figuring out when they are actually doing risky behavior. However, there's been a part of risk that they really haven't quantified yet, and that is the, the human interaction risk. So hu human interaction risk is rarely modeled. Um, social engineering is just uncalculated risk that they haven't built into their mitigation policies. Um, and one of the keys of this is that proximity, like your proximity to a person is a measure of your trustworthiness. So people trust people that they know. And people are more likely to respond to spear phishing from people that they know. So the example use case that we always that um, we like to use is the executive assistant. Um, so the executive assistant not, does not necessarily have access to a lot of things. However, just based off their proximity to partners that have client confidential information um, or things like that, they are still a huge risk factor because if you compromise their account. You're, you have essentially given yourself a uh, location from where you can spearfish a lot of different people. So they are a riskier account than someone who is actually privileged with the exact same privileges. So there, how, we've, we've been trying to model how this risk actually is and how, how risk sp spreads from people to people. And the way that we've been doing this is through graph analytics. So if you model all your assets and users as nodes, then you can create a graph of users to, in, users to assets and the interactions between them and see how risk spreads within your social network. Um, and then the strength of these relationships can also be built into this model. So people who are closer to each other will have stronger, will have stronger uh, risk transference properties. So you want, We've, we've been trying to understand the network of access available to each individual within the organization. So if I want to reach a particular asset from a particular person, how many spear phishing pivots would I need to take in order to reach this asset? And then from that, if you are a person that, hey, you're a common link that a lot of people have to go through in order to do a spear phishing attack, then you, are, you, are, you have a much higher risk inherent in your position. And there's actually been, th this actually correlates very well to a very uh, well, uh, very well um, studied graph analytic, graph analytic metric called betweenness centrality. So betweenness centrality is at its core, who is, who is the most, who, it's a score of each individual user based off of how important they are to shortest path travels across the entire network. So, how important is this person to reaching other parts of the network? And then once we do this calculation, we can identify who our golden key holders within our organization are and how the risk from those golden key holders spreads to people who may not necessarily have the access, but are people that if you compromise, you could get access from one of these golden key holders. And then once we do this, we can actually start to we can actually start to prioritize protections and actually build them into our risk mitigation policy, like making these people have dual factor authentication or other security controls to make it so that's harder for risk to travel from these people. 
So this sounds like a lot of manual data collection um, and building a social network. That, there's, that's, it sounds like a lot of work. However, there is an approximate repository of all these user-to-user -user interactions, and that is in the AD. So most well-organized well organizations have AD information in there that actually models who, that has hierarchical models of the entire organization. So who is your manager versus who, is, who, is, who are your subordinates? And from that, we can actually build a network, uh, user network model that gives us an actual, that starts to build that network. And then in addition to that, they usually have departments and locations as well. So if I see you every day, that is another, it, it is another way of measuring how well I know you. So if you're in the same location, we can say, okay, this is another interaction that we want to model. And then the other thing in the AD is it has all the privilege information as well. So if we harvest all of these AD logs, then, or all these AD entries, then we can figure out, okay, this person has access to these assets based off the member of, uh, the member of fields that are associated with this account. So, and then from those member of fields, we can even run some filters on them saying, if there's an admin, in, if there's admin accounts in here, we're just gonna, we're gonna make them more important as well. So it's harder to get to these accounts. And then specific PII is another example of that. So once, once, once we harvest all this information, um, we can actually start to build a network. And so, like I said before, nodes will end up being users and privilege groups. And then edges will end up being user-to-user -user interactions or user-to-privilege interactions. And then we can do some variable weighting based off the importance of the privilege. If it's an admin account, we're gonna make that edge worth more. Once, once we have this network, we can calculate between the centrality score. So how much each node contributes to the travel distance. Um, and for, for, those of you, for those of you who um, have taken some algorithm theory, it, the, the, between the centrality is essentially um, a calculation of if I have one node on the network, what, or for every single node on the network, uh, how, how many times does every other uh, every other shortest path in the network run through this node. So it's, it's, it's essentially a measure of how important you are to moving throughout the network. And then the, 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 for, for the algorithm people out there, the big O calculation of this is just the number of vertices cubed. So it's a fairly lightweight algorithm. Okay, so to test whether this analytics would actually capture the behavior we would expect of it, though, um, I went ahead and built an actual network of influence for our uh, technology lab. So I scraped the AD and pulled all this information and built an actual user network um, that corresponded to our, to, our, to our network. And then we, we wanted to see if the behavior we expected would actually emerge when we ran this between the centrality algorithm. So, the behavior we were expecting is that users in pro proximity to valuable privileges would receive, receive higher between the centrality or importance scores. And then, so this is, this is the actual graph of our network. Um, blue nodes like these are users, while as orange nodes right here are privileges. Um, and then the, the size, the actual size of the, uh, the node, it corresponds to how high they ranked in the between the centrality score. So, these two users right here um, are our network operations manager and our security manager who is also functions as our systems admin. So they have, they have a lot of accesses to these, to these admin privileges right here that no one else has. So as expected, they're receiving extremely high between the centrality scores. That's, that's, that's behavior we would expect from them. And then these these edges are all weighted very heavily because they are admin accounts. But what we really want to know is how does risk propagate from these, from these two people. So our workshop coordinator is provisioned on basically the bare minimum of the, of the privileges that we have. However, 
they work very closely with our network operations manager and our systems admin in order to deliver workshops that we actually give to clients. So they have to be in close contact with them and they, they work with them almost every day. So we can see here th though that they have actually received a higher, a higher centrality score despite being provisioned the exact same, the exact same privileges. So they, they would be a perfect person that to, uh, to spearfish. And to put, put a real life uh, attack vector or risk vector to this, um, a spearfishing attack from our workshop coordinator asking them to approve an agenda or something like that, but that agenda has macros enabled, so they would actually be compromised, it'd be much, it'd be much more likely to succeed from them as opposed to someone else in our lab or someone else, else outside the organization. So we can, we can kind of see that the between the centrality algorithm is, uh, is providing value in identifying our risk spread, um, ri is providing value identifying how our risk spreads um, from our high impact users to users adjacent to them or in proximity to, to them. And so for, for the specifics of this algorithm, I, lim I limited it to, uh, to uh, four, four nodes out. So the, the between the centrality only calc, it, it would be, um, it, it would be very, it would not be uh, enough to expect for the beyond, someone wouldn't be able to do four spear fishing, spear fishing pivots um, in order to get from one thing to the other. So we actually, we actually did limit the actual shortest, the size of the shortest pass that you could, that you could actually travel. And that, so, so going forward, risk quantification analysis like this can help inform our decisions uh, when we tailor risk mitigation techniques. Um, so if, if we wanted, if we wanted to, to kind of account for this risk that we haven't captured yet, we could, we could do things like focus training on specific people who are close to these users, however, uh, to these high impact users, however, are not, are not uh, specifically provisioned those, those accesses. Um, and then we can also tailor security controls to, to uh, tailor security controls to target these users and make it so that it's, it's harder to access their accounts. So for instance, dual factor authentication or something like that. Um, or, or just even limit the amount of privileges that they have access to. So, Determining all this information is great, um, but it's really just a starting point. Um, this, this, this model doesn't take into account a lot of different other um, complications that, you would, that uh, risk comes from. So for instance, we can also factor in hardening. So as a cybersecurity lab, we are probably more, less likely to respond to a spear phishing attempt because we know what to look for. Whereas in a marketing department, maybe they don't know as much what to look for, so they would be more susceptible to actually uh, entertaining a spear phishing uh, or responding to a spear phishing attempt. So we can, we can factor that in to our risk models. Um, then we also have individual susceptibility to compromise. So there's an NYU uh, poly uh, psychological study. Um, and one of, the, one of the key things that came out of that is that 10% of people are gonna click on a spear phishing attempt no matter what. So they're just gonna, they're just gonna respond to it. Um, and that, that, is, that, is, that is bad, like, um, <laughs> that's very bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, but if we know who those people are, then we can also adjust for them in our risk profile. So um, for instance, we can do, uh, we can do um, testing spear phishing. So uh, I know there are a bunch of companies out there that actually uh, do fake spear phishing attempts to see who, who in your organization are more likely to respond. And if we can get that data, we can incorporate it into the model as well. Um, so we have a better representation of who, is, who are going to be the people uh, that, that can be compromised. 
then we also have dual factor authentication. A lot of these accounts, um, a lot of these accounts are not necessarily, or are dual factor authenticated. However, we don't know that in this model right now. Um, and if there's a dual factor authentication, it makes it much harder to tra traverse between from person to person. So we can maybe reduce how the risk spreads on over certain accounts. And then finally, um, there's a lot of social media information that, that just isn't accounted for in our network. I mean, you might be friends with someone and not work in close, close, relation to them, close relationship to them at all. So we could actually improve the underlying data by incorporating Facebook connections or Twitter, tw by scraping Facebook or Twitter to figure out who, who do people actually talk to in real life. Is this, is this something, th those edges can be built into into our actual, um, into our, into the into the base data to better understand to better model how the risk spreads, um, and then the end goal is to to have a quantified risk landscape for for pretty much the entire for pretty much the entire organization. So, like I said before, the between the centrality actually scales very well. So this could be this algorithm could actually be scaled out to do enterprise or larger level types of uh, uh, analyses. And having that information would help you, would help when they are tailoring their risk mitigation strategies. Okay? And it looks like I sped through these slides. So, uh, <laughs> questions? <laughs> Apologize for that. Yep. Uh, yeah, I like the crystal ball with your team. Mm -hmm. Hello, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, yes. <clears throat> I'd like to know if your crystal ball is working and if you'd be able to offer a prediction about how far in the future do you think we're away from uh, actual security audits beginning to take these kind of metrics into account uh, and possibly saying, hey, you know, if you, if you have these employees that failed mm -hmm. at the spear phishing, mm -hmm. they need to not be in certain positions. Please reassign personnel accordingly yeah. or you fail the audit or things like you. How, how soon do we see these kind of social engineering metrics actually made part of the audit process. Okay, so there there is there is some actual social engineering, social engineering being made part of the audit process already. Um, I know of a couple companies that already do the risk the risk testing essentially to say, okay, these are users in, in your organization. They're actually responding to to spear phishing attempts, and they just send. It's just an automated thing where they send, spend out send out spear phishing to every single person in the organization. Um, but the, I, I would say maybe five to 10 years before they can, they can actually incorporate human interactions into that, into that, into that risk profile. It, it is, I do believe it is coming, um, but it may not be as complicated as this. So I know as of now that a lot of, a lot of user behavior analytics is starting to take into account peer groups which is another, is another way to, to model user interactions. So peers that you work with uh, versus peers, like peers you work with, you should have the same type of activity. Um, if we see activity that deviate, deviates from those peer groups, then we're going to, we're going to flag that and say it's a risk. Um, So I noticed that when you had your uh, node map up, you mm -hmm. had a couple examples of, uh, of folks who you knew were important and mm -hmm. one example of somebody who you expected mm -hmm. uh, to have a higher risk yes. centrality mm -hmm. based on their position going in. Yeah. Uh, isn't the va part of the big value from this uh, the unexpectedly high uh, yes. target? Yeah. Did you have any examples of, of somebody who you wouldn't expect to have had as high of a risk centrality rating as it turns out that they had mm -hmm. and what sort of... Uh, Mitigations did you put in place for that person afterwards? Okay, so we did actually, we did actually uh, find some surprising things in there as well. Um, one of one of our consultants had access to a lot of a lot of the admin accounts um, because he was doing engineering, uh, and he generated a much higher risk score than than even our workshop coordinator. However he does need those accesses to do his job. So there wasn't really much we could do in the risk mitigation profile besides making sure that 
he's pretty hardened to phishing attacks and all, all of the rest of that. And we, we, do, do, uh, we, we do actually do hardening and trainings um, for, for risk profiles at Accenture. Was that the guy, uh, there was like uh, two big nodes in that big yellow cloud and then one, uh, if you'll take a look, uh, yeah. directly this guy, parallel. This guy right, or, no, it was this guy right here. Right, that, that guy right, <laughs> yeah. that was the one yeah. I was trying to ask about yeah. actually. Yeah. You know, who was that person yeah. that, that had that mm -hmm. huge, that large uh, of, uh, of an impact? Because when mm -hmm. you first put up the workshop coordinator, I'm going, that, that's outsized? No, the, the guy way over there, yeah. that's yeah. outsized. Yeah. No, the, the workshop coordinator is, just is just very interesting because they they are essentially priv priv uh, provisioned the barest level of access they have uh, they're more in charge of making sure that the workshop runs smoothly so they have to do the they have to be able to do um, a lot of the AV and uh, making sure the agenda is right and coordinating with the client in order to in order to um, figure out the topics and the agenda for the entire meeting. Um, and then I, I do actually want to call out the, uh, the visualization software that we use, Graphistry. It's very good. Um, and really good. that's uh, Graphistry. 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 Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they, they're, they're at, this, this isn't live. However, uh, it is interactive, the actual, um, the actual uh, network graph. Uh, so that gentleman actually took my question, <laughs> uh, so I'll have to ask another one. Um, what tool, did you use any tools outside of your own coding or your own okay. uh, to, to gather this kind of data and uh, information? Yeah, so, so the tools that I used was, I used PowerShell to uh, scrape the AD, um, and from that I, I converted it um, into, I pulled it into Python and I used PySpark in, er, in order to do um, the graph analytics. Um, yeah, PySpark, and PySpark is a distributed. Um, uh, it's a distributed. Uh, it's a lambda architecture that uh, you can do large scale analytics on. Um, I, I probably didn't need it for this. However, if I had done the entire AD for an organization, I probably would have needed to leverage uh, leverage that. And uh, I did use GraphX as well, which is a package of uh, PySpark. Uh, next question. I know you. Uh scraped AD for this, I would be interested to see how effective this opera, uh, this uh, uh, process would be if you were taking information out of LinkedIn. Yeah. You find here's a CEO and then mm -hmm. here's all the people that work at this yeah. company mm -hmm. and see if you're able to, I and guess, for, dummy up. For a something hierarchical like that. model. Right. You, you may not get the actual mm -hmm. admin rights, but you can make, I would suppose, educated guesses. Yeah. Well, know. so I did want to do this from the defender standpoint. That is someone you might, something you might do from an attacker standpoint. Scan a scan a LinkedIn uh, organizational chart and figure out who who actually works in close proximity to each other when you target your uh, when you target your um, spear phishing attacks. Well, then you could also find out what groups they're members of, what their interests are, and mm -hmm. yep, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yep. Um. So you're currently using uh, the AD to show how connected people are, mm -hmm. um, but really most people spend their time like communicating with other people through like email or mm -hmm. um, some type of chat. Is there a way yeah. where uh, you could scrape an email server um, to see like how much email traffic e or use the metadata of emails to figure out who's more connected to each other? Possibly if I had access to that data. The thing that's nice about the AD is that um, I don't need to have too much provisions in order to actually go ahead and scrape it and figure out who who is who um, like the manager who your manager is versus who your subordinates are all that stuff is publicly available within the actual organization you don't actually need too many privileges in order to get that information um, I could I you might be able to figure out SMT SMP traffic um, just a quantity um, and build weightings based off of that in order to go in order to figure out um, who actually talks to each other versus who doesn't, um, which would be another way of incorporating. So, in, it's it. Most of these things are about in, improving the underlying data that you're building the network off of, uh, the network of influent network of access off of. Um, any improvements to that are just going to. Uh, 
reap gains in the analysis. Um, you're only as good as your underlying data. I was just wondering if uh, any of the code you use to do this is publicly available or if you plan to release it in the future? Uh, I need to clean it up a little bit because there is, um, there is PII and client confidential <laughs> information <laughs> in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this is essentially a map of our, our AD. So, uh, <laughs> like, I, I anonymized it for this. However, I have, I, the, the values are actually still there, and I mostly just turned them off uh, from showing in the snapshots that I, that I had. Um, but I can't, I, I am planning to eventually put this out there. Um, I need to clean it up a little bit first, though. Cool. We have time for one more question. Anyone? One last question. No? Okay, so let's thank. Oh, you have? Wait. <laughs> Wait. Okay. 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 We call our big fishing in our organization crab decay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just our loving little term for it. All right, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll steal that. <laughs> so uh, that's it, and let's thank Lewis.